Welcome to this late session on forest landscape restoration enhancing more than carbon stocks. This topic, of course, we heard today the whole day about landscapes, but I would like to link that with the two organizations that host this, uh, this specific session, the Forest Landscape Restoration, which is IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of, of Nature, and the ITTO, the International Tropical Timber Organizations. Indeed, both organizations, independently and jointly afterwards, have somehow, you know, from the foresty side, invented this uh, restoration pathway in respect to forests. Indeed, IUCN already in 1998, and I remember this uh, famous session in Spain, brought this topic up in the international level in the forestry world. And it developed over time you know, through the global forest landscape restoration uh, until today's plant a pledge initiative. You will hear more about that. It developed this topic scientifically, but also from a very practical angle. The ITTO, uh, which is the International Tropical Timber Organization, which normally deals with tropical production forests, has also taken this topic in the very early of the year of 2000 and developed for its member countries already in 2002 very detailed guidelines on managing uh, secondary forests, restoring degraded forest, and rehabilitating degraded forest land. So both organizations somehow have been pioneers in this field. So I think this uh, is a very good opportunity also to mention that to, to you. Restoration has become much more important since we had Bali, since we have added the second D and the plus to the initial red. You know? And restoration and degradation you know, are two words you know, which are just flowing together in two different directions. Indeed, somehow you might say that to restore something is something old-fashioned. You know? When we restore, it looks, you know, there's some old things that we make new. But this is not the case in restoration. Indeed, rest <coughs> restoring landscape is first about people. Because the people who live in landscapes, they influence this landscape. So this is the first, which is not really old-fashioned. And the second element is that we use the existing natural resource base, maybe degraded or heavily degraded, but it is natural, it is there, and that we try to bring back. And this is somehow uh, the new thing on the whole. The restoration agenda, the degradation agenda in the Red Plus has brought a lot of new potential in mitigation. It's, you know, indeed, all the studies that have been done over the last couple of years and shown that most of the mitigation potential is at the level to restore existing degraded forests and not necessarily only at the level of avoiding deforestation. So in this sense, I think that is very good and timely to have a, a, a number of um, very important persons with us who can speak a little bit from outside these two organizations and from outside the technical um, background um, about restoration. Let me introduce briefly the panelists. Uh, and let me start with the two ladies, if I can, and with our keynote speaker. Indeed, it is simply impossible for me in a minute to to make justice to the bio of uh, Bianca Jagger. Uh, but I try my best to take some highlights out of her rich career. Bianca is currently um, a Council of Europe Goodwill Ambassador. She is the founder and chair of the Bianca Jagger Rights Foundation. She's a member of the Executive Director's Leadership Council of Amnesty International US, 
and a trustee of the Amazon Charitable Fund. Bianca studied many years ago political science at the Sorbonne in Paris. Later, over her career, she has been a recipient for several honorary doctoral degrees, for example, of Stonehill College, Massachusetts, the University of East London, and of the human rights, um, and the doctorate of, on human rights in the Simon College in Boston. Let me also mention that among the many awards she earned are the Right Livelihood Award, which is known as the Alternative Nobel Prize in 2004, and the UN Earth Day International Award in 1994. But that only a couple of those many awards that uh, Bianca received. In June 2012, Bianca launched along with IUCN and Airbus Corporation, the Plant a Pledge Initiative, which aims to restore 150 million hectares of forests around the world by 2020. Bianca, we are honored to have you here, and we are very happy to have you as the keynote speaker. I would like to briefly introduce all the panelists before we hear um, the keynote speak. Um, on the right of Bianca is Dr. Yeti Rusli. Yeti is from Indonesia. She is currently the senior advisor of the Minister of Forestry in um, climate change and biodiversity questions. She holds this position since 2002. She has been very much instrumental in the development of climate change and forests in Indonesia. She's also the chairperson of the Climate Change Working Group of the Ministry of Forestry. She was prior the head, the, the director general of the Forest Planning Division in Indonesia. And those people who know Indonesia, they know this is a huge and big task as the second most important forest country in the world. Yeti held um, a master degree in forestry planning from um, the University of Alberta, correct? Sorry. And uh, a PhD degree from the Washington State University in Seattle. Thank you, Yeti, that you also came in very late. You see here a panel which indeed has been established only in the last 24 hours. The only rock and solid rock in this panel is Bianca Jagger. Thank you very much, Bianca, to respect from the very beginning the invitation of IUCN and IPTO in this regard. On my right, or on the left of Bianca, we have Juan Carlos Cintish. Cintish? Caramba, perdona. <laughs> Juan Carlos, it's más fácil, is the leader for international relations of the Indigenous Climate Change Forum, a coordination body of the in Indigenous Organization of the Amazon Basin, which we all know under COICA. Juan is an indigenous Shuar. So these are those people who, he told me that right before, no, cut your head <coughs> and shrink them, no? until today, besides. So he is an indigenous Shuar of the Amazon of Ecuador. Lord Chintias studied natural resources management at the University of San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador. He worked as a parliamentarian advisor in the former National Congress at the Republic of Ecuador. Juan Carlos is also the focal point of the global indigenous peoples at the UNFCCC. Thank you, Juan Carlos, also to come in uh, on uh, late call. Last but not least, we have Patrick Wiley. He asked me, you know, just make it short for me. He's a typical forester. You know, the foresters are this kind of timid. 
So one sentence about Patrick, of course I could speak here about two pages, but I will also leave it as you said. Patrick is a Canadian professional forester who worked in international forestry for the Canadian government and for the private sector in countries like Bolivia, Ecuador and in Southeast Asia. He is now the mitigation policy coordinator of IUCN based in Washington DC. He kindly agreed also to fill in for Stuart McGuinness. Most or many of you might know Stuart. He is somehow the father of the IUCN Forest Restoration Initiative. He is ill, he couldn't make it, and of course, the one who regrets most not to be here is Stuart, for sure. But I'm sure that Patrick will do a good job. So our game plan for this afternoon is that Patrick gives you now a very short kickoff on the Forest Restoration Initiative, followed by the keynote speech of uh, Bianca Jagger, and then we will start to do a, a discussion among the panel members. You know already the game plan. Then it's your game, so your questions. And also we have uh, uh, coverage uh, through uh, the web. So we might also get um, some questions from somewhere else. So without due delay, so please, uh, Patrick, can you come and uh, present briefly? the issues relating to forest landscape restoration. Thanks, Jürgen. Thanks, well, I certainly have big shoes to fill and I won't keep you from uh, Bianca Jaga's words or keep you from uh, the microphone in your question. But I think it's important that we oftentimes speak past each other in these meetings. And so I think it's important that we start speaking about the same issues and make sure that we're seeing landscape, forest landscape restoration in the same way. So I'm gonna do that first and foremost by thanking you, uh, thanking you for, for allowing me to speak to you as a representative of IUCN, but more importantly on behalf of the Secretariat of the Global Partnership for Forest Landscape Restoration of which many of the members are in this room. And I think that's the most important piece of this is that <coughs> this is not an IUCN effort or an ITTO effort, although we've both involved for many years at the country level and at the global level, there are many leaders that are there and we're, we're here to celebrate that in a certain way and bring some encouragement, I think, to the, the air of uncertainty and gloom that can be over the cops. And I thought I'd start actually by breaking one of C4's rules to maybe pick you up a little bit and show you two quick images of inspiration. The first, which some of you have seen before and others haven't because we're trying to bring together agriculture and forestry here for, these first, for the first time here. And that's what landscape restoration has been trying to do for quite a while. As we said, it's not a new idea. On the screen, you see two billion hectares of potential that will help us bridge some of the difficulties that we have in the emissions world. The other two, though, this is, you know, we always zoom out, and we heard a number of comments earlier today in previous sessions and questions about how do we get down to details, how do we solidify action. Again, it's already proven. We already know where we're at. Korea is a wonderful example where we've had development and economic growth with people involved. And this was the case in 1960. Fast forward and we see opportunity. And this is a powerful message I think that people can identify with globally at a landscape level. And I could put other slides up but at the end of the day where we need to be is to look at the landscape behind us on this wonderful wall. And this is really the mosaic that we're trying to look at. Somewhere in this mosaic, there are different opportunities. And I think that's an excellent way to think about this as we go through. There are actions that are appropriate for each landscape. We know there's big aspirations at the, rest, at the international level. And we could list, you know, within Cancun, Biodiversity Achi Target 15, recent uh, calls for the hyperbed call on ecosystem restoration, and items out of the Rio summit. But ultimately, we need to think about what does this look like on the ground? And I think I've just tried to highlight a few of these opportunities for you. You know, we know that single fix solutions are not the way forward. And I won't give you motherhood and apple pie here as we go to the other panelists talking about opportunities and how we've moved forward. But certainly, we can be missing out on the full range of benefits if we're solely focused on carbon. That's the title of this session. We see the, the role of sustainable landscapes in meeting multiple objectives can only be fully realized 
if we pursue an, a balanced package of locally defined ecosystem goods and services, rather than attempting to maximize one single. And it should be clear that landscape restoration, as Jürgen said in his introduction, and I think he said it quite well, we're not looking to recreate the past. Past land use decisions were made for a reason in that locality that made sense. So clearly something wasn't working if we see that what we want is something other than this landscape behind us. So we've talked about focusing on one big thing that we can do is something that was said very ably in a past session. Focus on one big thing and move forward and that big thing we feel is forest landscape restoration. Each landscape needs its own approach. Wide scale and mosaic restoration opportunities exist. You see that in the southern part of the wall behind you and in the more treed portion above it. But at the end of the day, different dynamics are integrated into one landscape. It's a living landscape at the end of the day and nature-based solutions are part of that. And at IUCN, I'm quite proud to be representing that. I can, also, I can say also that the work by IUCN, WRI and other members, as I showed you on the World of Opportunities map, this is a clear opportunity for two billion hectares of land that could benefit from restoration. It would not and should not all be in the form of forests, but common to each hectare will be the contribution of trees and woody biomass. And we can often preach to the same choir here at these sessions, and so I won't go into the details necessarily of all the, the actions that can go there, because the actions that exist and the activities that will get us there are within the national circumstances and the leaders that are already in this room. What I will say is that the action will take many forms. And as we saw in the case of Korea, there is a remarkable recent history of restoration, and it's counterintuitive. I thought it was important to show the images first so that I broke the rules early and then got back to the format. Korea entered the second half of the 20th century as degraded landscapes after decades of war and conflict. However, over 50 years, we saw restoration of landscapes through development, and nearly 50 times doubling the national income. We saw population increases, but we also saw a return of ecosystem function. And that's an important piece, and I think it's an important piece to grab onto to see that we can have multiple benefits coming out at the same time. This does not have to be a duality. We don't have to have this dichotomy between development and emissions reductions. So at the end of the day, I will end on a single point, which is economics and timelines, the benefits, the bond challenge, landscape restoration. Despite progress that we've seen in some of the examples that, in the example of Korea, in Tanzania, in many landscapes that we have, I think there's two key myths that we need to overcome. That landscape restoration costs too much and landscape restoration takes too long. The Korea example was over 40 years. If it took 50 years, if 50 years is too long for you and the Ministry of Natural Resources and local communities in northern Tanzania in a 15 year period can bring back 2 million hectares of new natural forests and agroforests that nearly doubled household income. Maybe 15 years is a better timeline for you. Maybe that's something that we can do before we get to top 25, six or seven. That would certainly be an interesting opportunity and I would certainly look forward to that world of opportunity. The other myth that we need to dispel is that it costs too much. And as so clearly illustrated by the Korean example, landscape restoration can and ought to be fundamentally an economic driver rather than a financial burden. The knowledge that we have to get to large scale opportunities is we need to have proof of concept. The proof of concept's there, it was on your screen, you'll hear from it in our panelists, but I think we should be clear that if we meet the bond challenge, which we'll hear more about in a minute, of 150 million hectares restored by 2020, of which we have parties to, that are here in Doha that have lived up to obligations and have pledged voluntarily to move towards this target. I, analysis by IUCN, WRI, our GPFLR partners, and a number of associates show that we could restore 150 million hectares of forests and degraded lands worldwide. It would generate nearly $80 billion a year in benefits for local communities. If we look at what Korea did over 50 years and a 50-fold return on its investment, imagine what could be done in Tanzania in 15 years and as we start building on those opportunities. I'm gonna end there and get to hand back to Jurgen. I wanted to make sure that we're not speaking past each other, that we're sh clear that la forest landscape restoration isn't about a tree. And I think we'll hear a few more examples. So thank you for your time and, and thank you. Thank you, Patrick. My, my only task is 
to uh, ask you to come to the podium. Bianca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jurgen. Good afternoon. Thank you for your kind words. And um, it is a pleasure to be speaking to you today at the Sixth Forest Day Conference, Solutions for a Sustainable World. It is a pleasure because I know that the majority of the people who are here are committed to making a difference in the world, who know what the challenges are that we are facing today and who are determined to be part of the solution. Before addressing the topics of my speech, I would like to say to you just a few things about me for those who don't know. And I know that Jurgen did a very good um, job in trying to uh, give you a good bio. I was born in Nicaragua, and I grew up under the dictatorship of the Somoza regime, and left Nicaragua to study political science at the Institute of Political Science. Since then, um, I have campaigned for human rights for the last 30 years, for human rights, social justice, and environmental uh, protection. And uh, in 2006, I decided to found the, the Bianca Jagger Human Rights Foundation, and I share that organization since then. During my 30 years of campaigning for human rights, social and economic justice, and environmental protection, my work has taken me around the world, from Latin America to Africa to Asia to the Middle East. And, uh, and I'm sure that it will take me to many, many more places around the world if I have many years to live. Um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about where we stand today before I talk about Plant a Pledge because I feel that it will put it in the context of the challenges that we are facing. We stand on the precipice of various global crises, but I found it inspiring that we are all here together because we want to find solutions. A recent report by the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and Climate Analytics commissioned by the World Bank, released in November 2012, which is called Turn Down the Heat, Why a Four Degrees Centigrade Warmer World Must Be Avoided, delivers some alarming and long overdue facts. As the report states, a four degrees centigrade world is so different from the current one that it comes with height, wide height, uncertainties and new risks that threaten our ability to anticipate and plan for future adaptation needs. The four degree scenario are devastating, the report states. The inundation of coastal cities, increasing risks for food production, potentially leading to higher malnutrition rates, many dry regions becoming drier, um, wet regions wetter, unprecedented heat waves in many regions, especially in the tropics, substantially exacerbated water scarcity in many regions, increased frequency of high intensity tropical cyclones and irreversible loss of biodiversity, including coral reef system. It is really a sobering report and what is extraordinary about this report and the fact that the World Bank released it is that I looked at this report and I thought, oh dear, there's things I could have written myself or that I have written, and it um, inspired me or encouraged me to see that the World Bank is willing to um, commission a report like this and willing to release a report like this warning us about the threat of the four degree centigrade. 
We know that even a few degrees temperature rise will drastically change the habitability of the planet and bring about potentially catastrophic change in water sources, forests, food, health, and business. Because what is important to understand is that this is not only going to affect us, it is going to affect everything in our world, including business. Climate change will affect everyone throughout the world, in every nation, and from every socioeconomic uh, group. It will affect cities, rural areas, economies, food, security, and health. The physical shape of the land and coast, every aspect of our lives throughout the developing and the developed world. Today, I went to a very different conference, and uh, um, the vice president from the IPCC quoted something very interesting. He quoted Svante Archimenius, a Swedish scientist that observed in 1869 that if CO2 levels continue to rise, global temperatures will be also rise, but around four degrees by the end of the 21st century. It seems that he was much more of a visionary than many of the people who are here negotiating are willing to be, since we continue to talk about being under two degrees centigrade and not really taking into account the gap between where we are and what the science tell us that we need to be. The effects of climate change can already be seen across the world. Hurricane Sandy, um, record floodings in Beijing, Manila across the UK and in Russia. Scientific America posted an article yesterday in Talto, mega storm could drown massing portions of California. The editor noted that they are making the article freely available now because of the flooding underway in California. The article was scheduled to appear in the January 2013 issue of Scientific America. But because I have a Twitter account and I continuously <coughs> do research, I stumble upon this, this, um, this article, which gave me um, um, <coughs> terrible nightmares yesterday before I came to see you. The extreme weather event of 2012 are but a hint of things to come. Ofwang's Ofwang, September uh, 2012 report, extreme weather, extreme prices, is unequivocal. These weather events are not isolated or coincidence. Extreme weather is the new normal. The cause of these changes is, of course, the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere. Last week, the World Meteorological Society reported global CO2 concentrations of 394 parts per million. The atmospheric CO2 concentration has risen by 31% since 1750 and is now at the highest level since the last 420,000 years. According to the World Meteorological Association, between 1990 and 2011, there was a 30% increase in the radioactive forcing, the warming of the global climate due to C CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And you may wonder why the hell is Bianca Jagger talking about all of this when she's supposed to be talking about plant a pledge. Well, the, the reason why I'm saying is to why did I, as a human drug campaigner, decided to support and to become ambassador for the IUCN plant a pledge campaign? Because you see what it says in here, that we have a 294 um, par per millions now, according to um, James Hansen's, the famous scientist, we're supposed to be at 350 par per million if we want to keep the, uh, the, the climate under two de the increase under two degrees centigrade. So what the hell are we doing when we are already at 394? And how can we not be reacting? And where are our leaders not signing the Kyoto uh, Agreement beyond uh, 2012, December 31st? So let me tell you 
uh, there is something very interesting that I was reading uh, in preparation to this and in preparation to an article that I'm making um, that talks about the gaps and the different gaps that we are facing here. Uh, it is uh, that we have, we hope that COP18 will not be remembered as the UN conference that failed to close the gaps. As you know, COP18 is faced with the emission gaps, the Kyoto period gap, the finance gap. We are threatened by the fiscal cliff. World leaders need to commit to a second period of the Kyoto Protocol beginning on the 1st of January 2013 for an eight-year duration ending in 2020 to avoid any gap between the end of the first period and the new global agreement. The Durban Platform for Enhanced Action proposes adoption of a climate agreement by 2015 and implementation in 2020. Unfortunately, as we all know, this may be far too late. The good news is that all of this, everything is not lost. There are things we can do. Plant a pledge is one of them. In May of 2012, I was appointed ambassador for IUCN Plant a Pledge campaign to support the bond challenge. The aim of Plant a Pledge is to support the bond challenge target to restore 150 million hectares of degraded land and the forested land by 2020. This is the largest restoration initiative the world has ever seen. The Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration has mapped 2 billion hectares of deforested and degraded land across the globe, an area the size of South America without and with the potential for restoration. The stern review on the economics of climate change recognizes that curbing deforestation is a highly cost-effective way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> deforestation constitutes nearly 20% of the overall emission and is accelerating climate change. The world forest stored 289 gigatons of carbon in the biomass alone and can be used as a tool to mitigate climate change. Restoring 150 million acres of forest landscape could sequester approximately one gigaton of carbon dioxide per year. The Bond Challenge and Plant a Pledge have never been more relevant. Restoration of the graded and the forested land is not simply about planting trees, and I am all for planting trees. Restoration would repair the damage not only to ecosystems, but crucially to human lives. People and communities are at the heart of the restoration effort. Transforming barren or degraded areas of land into healthy, fertile working landscapes. Restored land can be put to a mosaic of uses, such as agriculture, protected wildlife reserves, ecological corridors, regenerated forest, managed plantation, agroforestry systems, and river or lakeside planting to protect waterways. We launched Plant a Pledge at a press conference in Rio Plus 20 in June 2012, where we announced landmark restoration commitments totaling 18 million hectares. The United States Department of Agriculture Forest Service pledged 15 million hectares. The government of Rwanda, 2 million hectares. And the Mata Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact of Brazil, a coalition of government agencies, NGOs, and private sector, uh, 1 million hectares. The success of the campaign and the number of restoration and deforestation pledges has exceeded all expectations. We far exceeded the restoration target for 2012, which was 7 million hectares. BMS Rathor, Joint Secretary Ministry of Environmental and Forest India, has indicated that India commit, is committed to the bond challenge in a pre-pledge of 10 million hectares at the Convention on Biological Diversity, COP11, in Hyderab Hyderabad. We look forward to India formalizing their commitment with 
uh, IUCN and the GPFLR. I've been told that we may have some surprises when we have our press conference on Thursday, and I hope that it will become a reality. Damage to our forest and ecosystems could reduce global GDP by about 77% and halve living standards for the world's poorest community by 2050. Forests sustain our most basic needs. They are vital for clean air, food, three quarters of the world fresh water shelter, health, and economic development. 1.6 billion people, almost a quarter of the world's population, depend on forests for their livelihood. 300 million people call forests their home. We urgently need to put public pressure on government, business, big landowners, and communities to contribute to the bond challenge target. The Plant a Pledge campaign, devised by IUCN and sponsored by Airbus, aim to do just that. Each pledge at www.plantapledge.com supports a global petition directed at world leaders, and I urge you all to please, while you are here, go and plant a pledge in our website. Restoration can help lift millions of people out of poverty and inject more than 80 billion per annum into local and global economies while reducing the gap between the carbon emission reductions government have promised and what is needed to avoid dangerous climate change by 11 to 17 percent. And we will see the benefits not only in our lifetime but in years to come. The crises we face are global and we will only solve them through global collective action. I hope that our leaders will prove us wrong in Doha and close all those gaps that are there. I hope we can avoid falling off the fiscal cliff. I hope we can do better than yet another round of negotiation trapped in stalemate or vague promises of hot air. It is important because what is at stake is not only the planet, our future, but the future of our children and our grandchildren, the future of future generation. But in the meantime, you can support this initiative that makes a difference. And I hope that we will continue on together making a difference in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bianca, and thank you also to put this topic also in the wider context for what we are indeed here in Doha. It's always good that we are remembered for that. Juan Carlos, there is one sentence which struck me in the speech of um, Bianca. It's the following, restoration will repair the damage not only to ecosystems, but crucially to human rights. I have the feeling this is a ball directly to you. Do you want to take a stake on that? Thank you, Jürgen. Um, before to start, my millionaram Juan Carlos Hintiachke, Thomas Andemash, Amikru, Eshman, Nuas, Amik Madhe, Kakaram Pustarum, Kakaram Wetarum. I'm trying to connect this moment with the beautiful speech that Dr. Bianca has mentioned to connect the spiritual connection that what I am here, what indigenous people are in this role here. Um, indigenous people, we are following all these international discussions. I'm talking about the benefits that indigenous people, we are living there in the ground forever, for centuries. And also to mention in the context of the human rights, indigenous people, or, or the first safeguards is to protect our territory. I have so much sentiments to share, but I don't also have too much time, but I would like briefly to comment that many leaders are here around trying to follow and to listen all the single words that the negotiators are coming over. 
traditional knowledge, full and effective participations, rights, and we need to a lot of share. We have our own initiatives in that context. Just we need to say something, please listen to us, human beings, human people living there forever. And we can contribute a lot to reduce these big gaps that I will mention, how the rainforest, all territories are contributing to cool this planet. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Yeti, you are representative of the Indonesian government. Indonesia is the second most important tropical forest country. What is your uh, work, what is your interest in forest landscape restoration? Thank you, Jürgen. <coughs> um, living landscape restoration, what does it mean for Indonesia? So as we hear from keynote uh, speakers, I think all of us or almost of us agree and also from my friend, uh, Carlos mentioned already. Uh, for Indonesia, concept and implementation probably not very much known by the world. So those who like to rise uh, in, in this afternoon. Uh, when we see uh, living landscape restoration, we have to see as a broader landscape also. So in Indonesia, we use the term of forest land use that have, have been introduced even since before independence. For example, we call it a forest registered in Java Island and Sumatra Island that now we recognize as protected forest. So in tropical island countries like Indonesia, we only have a big island like Sumatra, Kalimantan, and Papua, and other islands about 17,000 islands is according to small island with the uh, tropical landscape with the active uh, mountain. So we really need to take care of ecosystem. When we talk about ecosystem, we talk about the human life. We talk about the ecosystem, flora and fauna and unique of ecosystem. So what is the fundamental variable here or criteria uh, which shape the main forest function. In Indonesia, we recognize the main forest function, conservation forest, protected forest, and production forest, and other land use for agriculture and others. So this is a forest land cluster in Indonesia. And the micro landscape is the following the main function for management of the land. So the criteria, the main criteria is the slope because you are a mountain island. The slope is very important to taking care and soil type and also the pre precipitation or rainfall. So how we determine the protected forest, production forest, and other land use, already been recognized by our constitution, even since 1967. This is the first law in a forestry. Come to the forest and climate change. At least, at least, uh, what does it mean by trees and forests? In order to intervene uh, CO2 in CO2 cycle at least three rules of forests and trees, absorbing CO2, come from forest fire, from the decay and others. And the second part is CO2 from energy burning. So transforming CO2 into solid C through photosynthesis. Next is maintaining solid C more longer in a forest and also very important in the future, producing biomass sustainably for what? 
for green energy, renewable energy, for green products. So, interpreting landscape restoration for us could be mean as how to improve activities, how to scale up activities, management for all type of forests. We talk those in at the United Nations Forum on Forests, all type of forests. And how Indonesia deal with the forest development and climate change. Landscape already embedded in our policy, regulation, and management. Now the challenge is the activities. Talking about the climate change without scaling up, without speeding up, the activities, the program, we don't have a significant meaning to intervene the CO2 in the atmosphere. So what Indonesia did so far, as we are aware of our rate of deforestation is very high in the period of 96 to 2000. We are aware of that. Many international publication also written on that. We did combat illegal logging, illegal log, log trading, and probably famous with our program with the EU under flag T, and we come up with a VPA, voluntary partnership agreement, and now we have a, a timber legality certification system. And the next is we have national movement of planting trees. At least now, in a now it's in the third year, target of one billion trees per year. One billion trees per year. So I say that heal the world by planting trees. And we have improved our regulation, technology and innovation. Even for thick trees, we know that thick trees need 100 years to grow to be harvested. Now we have only five years, we can get 23 centimeter diameters and 12 high. Those are innovation that we have, just for example. And what we hope from REDD Plus and climate change? We talk about forest carbon and conservation. That before we didn't recognize that. And we talk about forest carbon and degraded land, enhancing forest carbon stock. And we talk about forest carbon, green product, green renewable energy. Talking about the effort, we need to be sure Indonesia that will really give the result, the real result for the future effort. For 15 years combat illegal logging, from 96 speci specifically until now, during 96 to 2000, we have rate of deforestation of 3.51 million hectares per year. But now, 0 0.45. This is a remote sensing 2011. So anyone can test it again. We will get the number around that. Now, REDD Plus is really hope for Indonesia and the world open really wide opportunity for forest countries to take significant effort of mitigating climate change. In order to scale up and speed up activities, we need all strategy for REDD Plus implementation. Technical matters, market, talking about market is efficiency and governance, and also investment. Another thing is I would like to mention here, improve global criteria and indicator related to forest and carbon cycle for REDD+. They are not the same with criteria indicator under Kyoto Protocol. They are really different. At least we need to improve. IPCC guideline 2006 may not enough to, real, to, bring, to bring the real implementation of REDD plus to maximum effort. 
that's a final words for me. Then I would like to ask Bianca, especially IUCN, ATTO, and my friend, and all of us here, really give a chance landscaping, restoration. We are looking forward for your deep attention to reach broader global general public to know about this and to support our effort. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Yeti. I think it is very interesting to hear how a big, huge country takes this, uh, this effort also on board. We know that a lot of small countries, they have taken a lot of efforts. And you have really a big challenge you know, with these huge areas and your thousands of islands, you know, which these different situations. Patrick, this is going to you because you showed a very nice map on restoration globally. You um, are also a promoter of this 150 million hectare target that Bianca also mentioned. How do you scale that up? You know? How do you implement that? Do you have, can you tell us a little bit about the methods <coughs> and give us maybe some examples? Sure, yeah. And I think there's a, a key piece here, which is, I think a big piece of it's through information. I'm gonna actually answer a question from the audience in a previous panel, which was what are the barriers to degraded lands and actually getting to them? I think part of it is that we don't have a huge depth of information like we have on the science of the broader climate change outside of our sector and that really it's getting down into the national details and the transboundary issues, I think. And I think a huge piece of this is, is some of the work of the GPFLR. Uh, one of the pieces that we've done of late has been working with the government of Ghana and trying to, and also in Mexico and some others, to drill down into the details and go, the map's great. Thanks for telling us where it is. We have a plan in Indonesia to plant many trees, but what about the nationally appropriate information? Where do we, where do we put those? Where is appropriate for one type of land use and not? And I think a huge part of that is the consultation process, and I think Red Plus is a mechanism, and the multilaterals have covered that very well, but there's a gap that needs to be bridged in looking at the national, at the national situation with the national data sets, and we've worked with the government of Ghana and supported the government of Ghana to actually roll some of that out and to drill down into the details and do a national restoration assessment. And that then can feed into national existing processes. So I think it, it's the data that's missing in a lot of cases. And I think it's some of the supporting layers, um, you know, this, the science, the soil, you know, these are things where I think bridging between forest day and agriculture day are, are quite helpful because at the end of the day, a lot of that information is going to sit in two different ministries that may or may not speak to each other often. Thank you. We are uh, in a world of red plus, as you all know. So we cannot have a discussion without mentioning this magic word. Juan Carlos, you work with indigenous red. What would be forest restoration for you? We imagine that the Amazon, this is forest, and if there's a problem, there is deforestation. But are there degraded lands? Is there space for uh, restoration? And what kind of restoration? And what does it mean for you? Is it in re respect to mitigation? Is it in respect to livelihoods? How would you, you know, describe that? Thank you, Jürgen. Um, before to go directly to the answer, I'm trying to connect that concepts in my own language. It's going to be quite very difficult. Mm -hmm. So as indigenous people, everyone, I'm going to use this my own experience. The role has the mother and father and the family. The mother of the first days when you are beginning to walk and they begin to teach and she's the first teacher of the forest. When you begin to walk, it gives to the role to the father to begin to do more walks in the forest, to go the waterfalls, hunting and other roles. So, and then you connect with this scientific knowledge that we for generations, we are keep 
maintaining them. So times are evolution, new concepts about constitutions, new concepts about the countries, collectives, rights, our indigenous people, leaders, and communities, all the times we are trying to put in the table, don't forget us, we are here as a human beings, first, first concept. Colonizations, open roads in the forest daily, persecuting indigenous leaders daily, makes a lot of pain to us. So, the vision of the elders, they will say one day, it will happen something, I read this happen. Inundations, change ecosystems, daily rains when they don't have to rain, too much hot heater in the forest. If something happened, we know it. If you put in the table many studies, scientific studies, let's say the indigenous territory, maybe 0 0.2 are degraded or deforested. And you put on the other side a protected areas and other territories, one four five percent are more degraded. So you can simplify that. For me, to connect related to your question is that all the time we were there, we need to con we connect in attention mitigation in the context of climate change. We were there looking all these changes. And we to be more effective, we need to recognize and put in the table in the context of the right, there is a collective rights for the human rights to recognize that we were in complete dangers because in the context of development, are we want to open more roads in the middle of the forest, do mining and oil without the free from informed consent? So it's time, it's a very perfect time to, for this dialogue important to us because we have many initiatives and this is one of one initiative that indigenous people, we have our own perspective, own visions and we know where to do with our traditional plants, our traditional typical indigenous names, forest and we want to use that and we, can't, we want sh to share to do something for the planet. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yanka, do you want to add something? The thing that I didn't say before <clears throat> is that a really important as aspect of the work that the Bianca Jagu Human Rights Foundation does is um, speaking in defense of indigenous people's rights, indigenous and tribal people whether we're talking about Latin America, where I work is in Latin America and in India as well, since I cannot work everywhere in the world. But <clears throat> I totally agree with Juan Carlos. Um, I believe that red cannot work unless they will respect the rights of indigenous peoples and communities. Um, I believe that no initiative that pretends to, um, to bring uh, benefits to communities and indigenous people cannot work if they will not take into account their um, positions and their rights. Uh, and that um, one of the greatest challenges that we face today is the model of development that we have been implemented for centuries throughout the world a model of development that doesn't respect um, communities and indigenous people's rights, uh, that um, is prepared to um, violate uh, and is, that goes, uh, doesn't take into account the protection of the environment and which only, uh, whose only aim is profit at the expense of human rights and the protection of the environment. So I couldn't agree more with what Juan Carlos just said. And I couldn't agree more that whatever we do, we need to rethink. We need to understand that in order to talk about sustainability, we need to uh, 
take into account those principles and that the, um, the process of granting um, concessions to mining companies, oil companies, gas companies who sacrifice the rights of indigenous peoples and communities and people throughout the world and the environment has to be stopped and that these companies have to be made accountable. But not only the companies, but the CEOs and the management of those companies. Thank you. I think that uh, we would like to open now for questions from the floor or observations. Yes, please. Alfredo Guillem, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy. Well, I uh, don't want to be provo provocative, but uh, I would like to start disagreeing with the statement by Patrick. Sorry, I don't remember your name. Um, I think that uh, the the problem of inadequacy of uh, data is uh, sure a problem, but before uh, tackling it, I would try to tackle the problem of uh, um, defining what type of data you need. And uh, then I am pleased to refer to the representative of the Indonesian uh, delegation, uh, who has uh, highlighted the need to emphasize uh, uh, to focalize and emphasize the attention of an ecosystem. Uh, the moment in which you uh, uh, make a gap analysis and uh, you, you are talking about restoration, uh, what, what do you want to restore? What aspect, you, the, the question that has been presented by the, the, the chairman. Uh, well, <laughs> particularly speaking in the current climatic trend, maybe you, you want to restore something that <laughs> might not be really the, the best thing to restore, uh, or maybe yes. Uh, maybe you mimic something of the past, uh, how valid it is. Well, I think what uh, is missing here, um, and is also recognized by one of the concern expressed in the plenary, I mean, the definition of what we are talking about, the language is completely um, personal, ecosystem, landscape, uh, you name it. Uh, so, if you want to integrate, yes, integrate what? Uh, indigenous uh, uh, relevance, social relevance, sure, you have to. But you can better do so if you speak about uh, um, function and, stru and structure and function of ecosystem. And nobody speaks about this. The moment in which you start speaking about this, you will discover that the ecosystem functions not only because there is uh, the contribution of uh, evapotranspiration of trees or whatever, but also because there are people doing something there, and then uh, automatically you involve people and you take uh, into account people. So my encouragement is to use uh, IUCN capacity to be a global uh, uh, reality, to uh, help uh, decision maker, but also us, donor, to be very strict in when we talk about uh, forest, about uh, uh, restoration, about uh, changes, global changes. And be strict starting with the, the language and understanding exactly what uh, we are talking about and where we have to uh, aim uh, our uh, contribution, our resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Patrick, do you want to say something? Why don't we take a couple at the same? Okay. We'll good. take a couple in that way. Mm -hmm. As many people's voices are heard as possible, and then we'll we'll take some. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. My name is Ed Barrow, and I work with IUCN. Um, I've got a couple of simple little questions, but maybe a bit more difficult to answer. If we restore forests, who has stewardship rights and responsibilities for those forests, and why? i.e., who has the rights and responsibilities? Secondly, Andrea and I were just discussing, can communities plant a pledge? Can a village in country X register and plant a pledge? And lastly, from my own experience, we, there's a lot of good forest policy out there in many, many countries. Yet the policy rhetoric is not often translated into the implementation reality. Why? Uh, 
Thank you, Ed. Yes. Stefan Salvador, Forest Stewardship Council, FSC. Um, I was very pleased to hear this morning Professor Stefan mentioning stewardship is actually a term that we should more, more fill with meaning um, because this is what it's all about and linking biodiversity and, and climate uh, aspects. Um, it happened actually last year that when the, the bond challenge was launched that exactly at the same time FSC passed about the 150 million hectare threshold of certified uh, forest but largely natural forest and 10% plantations. Now, some say that was not, did not make much of a difference because deforestation is ongoing as ever. Others think it has had been a huge success. Now, when I hear 115 million hectares until 2020, I think it's a huge ambition, but what I wonder most is what, how do you plan to ensure how do you, I, I hear a lot of numbers, but I don't hear much about the quality of what you want to do. How do you want to ensure that what you do is, you do it right? Um, to what frameworks do you want to refer to? Um, to what um, minimum standards are you thinking of? And how do you ensure that uh, you exactly avoid the mistakes that have been made in the past that um, good intentions lead actually to adverse impacts in the end? Thank you. So we take one more. And, oh, oh, okay. Two more. Yeah, d just picking up on that, I, I was. I, I also wanted to come back to the quality. Can you question. identify? Uh, sorry, my name is Lou Versho from C4. Um, I also wanted to come back to this quality question. You know, there are tipping points out there on the landscape, and we've been painted. A, there's a very rosy picture of, of forest re rehabilitation or restoration that's been painted here. My experience in 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 India is that there are many areas, large areas that are rehabilitated, but I can point to many areas that despite 20, 25 years of rehabilitation have had 0% increase in soil organic matter, 0% increase in hydraulic conductivity, 0% increase in soil nutrients, and only covered by low quality anagesis uh, species. It has to be more than just hectares, it has to be about quality, it has to be about the ecosystem function, it has to be about the stewardship. And, and this is what I'm, I'm not hearing in this. There are tipping points out there, and uh, the question I have is, why are we not going after policies to stop the degradation? Why are we focusing on rehabilitation when actually the problem persists? India loses 100,000 hectares of, for, of, of soil to, to degradation every single year. We, that has to stop. It's not just about rehabilitation. So quality of rehabilitation, but also stopping the processes of degradation need to be a key focus. Thank you. Over, over there. I'm Shukuru Nyagawa from Tanzania. Yeah, hearing from one of the presenter, he said that landscape approach takes time and it is costly. So I was asking if like uh, Tanzania, I mean a country like Tanzania would like to implement red activities in a landscape approach, what advices one could give to ensure that the, uh, the project delivers on time and ensures sustainability and, and all of us we know that country like Tanzania depends on donor uh, support. So how one could advise the country like Tanzania uh, how to go about implementing red activity in a landscape approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we should stop here because uh, we need some time to answer. Patrick, can you take the first question? I, think I will take a cross-cutting approach to the yeah. number of questions. And I will start in a completely self-interested way to say that I completely agree that there's not enough detail that you've heard here today, so I will give a very deep plug for a side event that we're having on tools and policies later this week as an official side event. Sorry to C4 for distracting. But to get back to some of the questions that were there, uh, I'll try and take Lou's question, the Tanzania one, and leave some for others. I think clearly what we're, we're not talking about exclusively restoration efforts. I think we're talking about 
restoration as a part of a comprehensive strat national strategy. And I would clarify that with, when I say we, I mean International Union for Conservation of Nature, both the Secretariat, our members, and our partners. And so the government members that we have have their own individual strategies to go about it. In terms of the actual FSC element of it and how the question from FSC, sorry, there is a steering committee that's set up to assess, um, to assess bond challenge pledges, the quality, and there's a rationale to that. And I won't speak to that. There's certainly members here that are, are better able to do that. But I think in terms of the integrated strategy approach, and to wrap up and be brief, there are already examples of ITTO guidelines for restoration that I think can help buffer and really fence in, not in the traditional physical fence, but in the idea of what's the best practice we can use to get there um, that can try and get over some of the, these science, you know, these actual ecosystem function dead zones that you were highlighting in India, Lou. And I think for Tanzania, in northern Tanzania, we've seen some excellent examples of restoration that's already occurred. It is not underneath a red plus mechanism and all the MRV and the technical pieces that are there, but the nationally appropriate information that's required to move that forward came about from political decision to do that. So I think that the bond challenge is part of leveraging that political necessity that's needed to bring about the landscape planning that's required to figure out where is appropriate for restoration, where, and I think Indonesia highlighted the sort of zonation that's required to go through a triad type approach or otherwise. But certainly we're available um, to discuss and we have many tools that are, that are around. But I'll hand it back to Jurgen or to others. Thank you. Um, Yeti, maybe uh, I can ask you uh, to look at the, one of the questions from Ed Barrow on, um, there are a lot of great policies out there and for sure Indonesia has also great policies on the, the level of forest conservation and management. But the problem is the lack of implementation. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that or? Or is that not a correct observation from the floor? Yeah, uh, I think I would like to mention that uh, some variable of you mentioned about the social integrated and things like that. So uh, this we know that this is already included in, in a main element of the development. So of course, uh, every country will include those uh, social and how it's imp implementing in the field it's really depend on many variables. For example, we are aware of Indonesia, we have some uh, crucial periods uh, where happened a big illegal logging, illegal log trading, and thing like that. So also uh, forest fire. So we know where it's happened, in what uh, forest function. So we know how to solve, to approach, uh, to solve the problem. So uh, other variable also, this is a, a global challenge uh, to really uh, deal with the climate change. Develop, developing countries really have a, 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 a short power to scale up the activities. We have a good practice example in the field, but how to scaling up those is really depend on the global uh, attention. So I think uh, it's come to the answer, how could we uh, fast our negotiation? But I think we don't have to wait until we finish. We can uh, back up with small action, even the small action, but real, uh, and bring the companionship in the world. Partnership is not enough. Let's have a trust. Do even something, even that small, but a real in the field. So. Thank you, Yeti. Thank you. Juan Carlos, can communities go for pledges? Or who has stewardship rights on restored forests and why should they, that be clearly defined? I'm trying to be very specific. As you know, I was mentioned that I was using cultural message 
or elders or, or traditional scientific elders, the shamans, how you call it, maybe you know, when they, they tell you when you're getting there as a leader, as indigenous or the messenger, do you know how to see? They say, yes, no. You know how to see and you need to learn. Do you know how to listen? They say, yes, no. You need to listen. So these techniques we use or sacred medicines to go in the rituals and then we see the tree. The tree is, is a person. Every single animals, flowers in the forest, the rainforest has energy and life. So that energy and life on the question that you're asking me, we need to concentrate, we need to support initiatives that for century the indigenous groups are discussing on the ground. That's why we call it red indigenous because we see in the holistic perspective, connecting biodiversity, climate change, connecting water service, ecosystems, habitats, etc. as a whole. We cannot put this in different pieces. This is an integral. So I hope so. I can answer this question. This, there's many opportunities to go forward with this. I hope so you understand, but we need to link it. We cannot see each other. Sure. Okay, thank you. Patrick, I can't let you out of the hook you know, with this other two questions on the one on the tipping point. You know, why concentration on rehabilitation and not stopping degradation? That was something I think which was uh, brought up. And I think in the same talk, it goes a little bit on the quality of rehabilitation or restoration, you know, which came from FSC. Can we say something about that? Sure. Um, I think on the data quality, since the question was directed to me, I think I, it bequeaths me to answer it. And I, I would qualify that I think if you're talking about data quality, then you probably already have a plan because you're talking about what the sensitivities to your plan are. So I would agree that I would agree that you need that, that ex you need to know what data set you're talking about, but somewhere between the global opportunity, which is what we talk about at COPS, and somewhere between submissions about what the role that restoration could play, the role of degraded lands, the role of deforestation, somewhere in between that matrix, there's a planning process that's going on domestically. I think part of what we're talking about is thinking about where do you actually find appropriate areas for degradation, uh, for restoration activities, sorry. And in that regard, I think that the data is going to play into part of it. Where can you document the carbon element of it if you're putting it into a red plus strategy? But the title of this session is not carbon enhancement from landscape restoration. The point is that outside of a red plus mechanism, you can do forest restoration. We've done it for years. We've done landscape planning for years. We have the capability to do it. We know what the data limitations are and there's volumes of information about what the barriers to being able to measure results are. So I would say that I may have misspoke in saying that talking about data quality is one of the barriers. I think the largest barrier is the political action. I think Bond Challenge has gone a long way to help bring attention to the issue in the same way that Stern Report and other large documents have brought about some movement from some key governments and so it's a bridge in a certain way to back to pledges, to get back to the community pledges. And you know, I don't know if Bianca wants to uh, give reference again to, to going and looking at plantapledge.com, um, but there's certainly a variety of, my understanding, a variety of different organizations that have pledged at different scales. Thank you, thank you, Patrick. I have, I see that the time is advanced and as Swiss I have to check especially, you know, to watch. I would like to invite you uh, afterwards maybe to come and to speak individually, you know, if you do not feel that uh, your, your concern has been uh, adequately addressed, Ed. Yeah? 
So please, you are invited to come here. I would like to ask the man in the far right corner who is very quiet for a reason, because he had to take notes, and uh, Steve Johnson from ITTO. Maybe you can give us in three, four sentences what you thought is the most important outcome of this discussion. Yes, uh, thank you, Jurgen. I'm not sure if I should say thank you, actually, but anyway, I will. Um, <laughs> I was desperately doing my two-finger typing, and it didn't leave me much time to reflect, but basically, I think what we heard this afternoon, and uh, this will be posted on the C4 website in due course, so you can all check it out and let us know if we got it wrong, but basically, the momentum for forest landscape restoration is growing, and especially with the bond challenge last year. It it's a, has great potential to, to deliver many multiple values, uh, poverty reduction, uh, improving human rights, sustainable development, and carbon sequestration among them. Uh, there's proven techniques available. We know about them. Uh, often the barrier is translating the policies into practice, and the issues there are often aligned with the same thing that stops us from doing many things, uh, political will and combined with resources. Uh, a major message that we heard from many of the speakers and from the floor is that uh, people need to be involved in this, that uh, if we try to bypass the local communities and the indigenous people, that it's not going to work, neither FLR or Red Plus. Um, there's a need for some additional data at the national level, but that's not the biggest priority. I think that's what Patrick just said. Um, and political will at the national level. Also, the idea that forest landscape restoration should be part of a package towards overall sustainable forest management and sustainable development. I think that came through. And that there's a need for some quality control in approaches like this, uh, forest landscape restoration, and in the assessment of uh, which, uh, which programs uh, to uh, promote or accept under things like plant a pledge. So those were some of the ideas that I got. Uh, I'm not uh, saying that it's exclusively uh, conclusive, but I think that's the general synopsis of the, the points that I heard this afternoon. Well, anyhow, thank you very much, uh, yeah. Steve. So uh, I only have to say once more, thank you to all the panelists, uh, Bianca, um, Yeti, Juan Carlos, Patrick, and also Steve. And thank you for your patience and um, all the best uh, for the rest of the week. Uh, thank you very much.